Right. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming to tonight's Learn at Home. I'm Sage Lanterman from URI Cooperative Extension, and I'm really excited um, for us to all be here tonight. I'm going to introduce you to our presenter in just a minute, but just to make sure you're in the right spot tonight, we're going to learn about unusual fruits to consider for your landscape. Advance to the next slide, please. All right, so if you're not familiar with Cooperative Extension, Cooperative Extension um, is the land grant here at the University of Rhode Island. And we basically, um, uh, we organize ourselves uh, by these different strategic areas of focus. So those are land stewardship, food systems and agriculture, water resources, energy efficiency, conservation and renewables, as well as healthy lifestyles. So if you have a minute or two, you'll wanna check out our website, which is uri.edu backslash coupex, and you'll see these pictures right on our website and you can click each one of them and all the different programs or trainings um, or different uh, services and resources um, will all become crystal clear. And we have something for everybody, whether you're, uh, home grower, like most of us probably here, or you are a uh, farmer, or you're someone that has a private well, or you found a tick, or your child came home with a tick. We have something for everyone. Um, so spend a few minutes and get to know us. Next slide, please. And cooperative extension, we have guiding principles, and those are that we are dedicated to Rhode Island's people and their communities. We are committed to improving their quality of life, their livelihoods, and the health of our natural environment. We also believe in social justice, and collectively, we strive to deepen our cultural understanding and proficiency while building capacity to create inclusive experiences to address diverse stakeholder needs. Next slide, please. Um, and just a couple housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, automatically, you're going to get an email following this workshop, and we have a couple of questions, and we would love it if you could take a few minutes to fill them out. Uh, we do uh, read them, and they do really help us improve our offerings in the future. So take a few minutes and fill those out. Um, and also, if for some reason you have to leave early, um, all of our workshops, the one tonight and all the ones that we've been doing for the past year are recorded and available on our YouTube channel. And a uh, majority of those are also in closed captioning and a big thanks to our URI master gardeners, the tech team volunteers that do that for us. And they make so much of this possible. Um, you can learn more about the master gardener program via that link below. All right, next slide, please. Okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> the slide disappeared. Oh, it's at the beginning. That's why it's right at the beginning. No problem. No problem. So let me introduce you. And also, before I forget, you'll notice that your video cameras um, are not on and that you can't unmute yourself. And that is intentional. We just realized it's a best practice when we have so many people in one virtual room. However, if you have a question, please just enter it into the chat and I'll do my best to ask uh, our presenter right at the tail end. And if we don't get to your question, uh, please visit our hotline where you can ask questions that way. And we'll have a slide for our URI gardening and environmental hotline at the end. Uh, without further ado, tonight we are going to learn about unusual fruits to consider for your landscape. And uh, here to present, I'm very excited, is Dr. Bridget Rummel, who has been teaching a number of these offerings for us. So if you've missed any of her previous lectures, you can also find those on YouTube. And Dr. Rummel earned her Master's in Ph. D. Culture from the University of Minnesota, and since 1991, she has been a professor in the Plant Sciences Department here at the University of Rhode Island. Crops, including, including fruit culture. Without further ado, Dr. Rommel, thank you so much for being here tonight. I'm excited. I think my raspberries are going to appreciate that I'm here learning. Well, I, I know that we started with something. Okay, thank you, Sajal. Um, and yeah. welcome to everybody. I wish I could see your faces, but I know that the people are out there. And I'm going to start with some fruits that you're probably familiar with, but we're going to go along and, and hopefully hit on some fruits that you might not be as familiar with. Some of them I'll talk a little bit more about specifics with managing them or some highlights, but I'm not going to get into a whole lot of specifics for most of these fruits because I don't have time. Um, 
I would only be able to do one or two if I did that. So there will be several resources listed at the end of the talk for you to get more specific information if you want to know more specific information about growing some of the specific ones we're going to talk about. So first off, we're going to talk about some of the fruits that are actually in the rose family related to roses, and it's known as the rosaceae family. Many of the fruits that we are familiar with that we grow, like apples and peaches and plums and apricots and cherries, they actually are also in the rosaceae family, but they aren't native to the United States. A number of the plants I'm going to talk about today actually are native to the United States, and that's why you might want to consider them, especially if you're interested in looking at some of the fruits that actually grew here way back before our time. So the first off, I'll talk a little bit about brambles, and that includes the fruits like blackberries, which are in the Rubus genus, and the red raspberry, which is in the Rubus idaeus genus and species. And this also includes raspberries that are yellow or golden in color, and they were developed as a mutation of the red raspberry species. And they're one that a lot of people have gotten interested in and more and more cultivars are being available. And I'll mention some specific cultivars toward the end of the bramble section. And then there are black raspberries, which are in the Rubus occidentalis genus and species. And they are very different from the blackberry. If you notice the circles I have, the one on the upper part, the yellow circle, that's a blackberry and the central core remains attached to it when you remove the blackberry from the plant but raspberries whether it's a red raspberry a yellow raspberry or a black raspberry when you harvest them that central core stays attached to the plant and is not removed with the fruit and the way raspberry fruits stick together is they've got these little hairs that help hold them together as well as they're they're just a little bit more glued together than the blackberries are so that's what a black raspberry looks like and if you look toward the bottom you can see that there's that hollow center and let me see if i can get my pointer going there we go you can see the hollow center that there's no core and that's because the core is attached to the plant so that's how the black raspberries differ from the blackberries so all of the brambles are biennial. That means each individual stem lives for two years. And the first year, we call those stems canes, and more specifically, we call them primal canes, which means the first year. They are vegetative, and then the second year, they start to flower and produce fruit. And in the second year, we call them flora canes. And just a little bit of description of the different brambles, and then I'll go into specifics after I talk about some of the management. Raspberry canes generally are erect or tall growing, and they usually do not need any kind of support. But blackberry canes, they may be either erect, semi-erect, or trailing types, and all of them generally benefit from some, some support systems. Now, there are some that may be described as thorny, and technically, Brambles do not have thorns. They actually have prickles. And thorns are modified ends of branches, whereas prickles are just extensions of epidermal cells that stick out from the stem. And so actually, when we talk about brambles and, and everybody talks about them being thorny, we're actually talking about them being prickly instead. But the word thorn is has been used in common vernacular for so long that they're still referred to that way. So brambles have different times of fruiting from early to mid to late season. So you have a lot of options with them and they are quite variable in their fruit quality as well as their flavor. There's also variability in resistance to diseases. So if you happen to have a particular situation where you run into certain kind of diseases at your particular site, there may be some resistant varieties that you might want to choose. And there are many lists of recommended varieties that are available from various extension publications or even commercial nurseries. And at the end of this presentation, I've listed a number of state extension sites that have additional information on not just the brambles, but many of the fruits I'm going to talk about tonight. 
So brambles are available typically as a one-year-old dormant bare root plant, or you can also get tissue culture plug plants. And you usually plant them when they're dormant. And especially if you have bare root plants, you should plant them as soon as the soil is workable in the spring. The bottom slide shows you a picture of ones that were produced in tissue culture in these tiny plugs. And they generally should be planted after any danger of frost is passed. They probably will not be quite as hardened off as some of the bare root plants. So brambles prefer a well-drained, sandy, loam type of soil, but they will grow in, in a fair amount of other kinds of soils. Fortunately for our area, they do well with our typical pHs because we tend to have soils that tend to be slightly acid with a pH range of 5.5, give or take. And seven is considered neutral. So even 6.5 is considered on the acid side as far as pH. Brambles also like moderate fertility and or soil organic matter. So when you are established them, it, it's always good to incorporate organic matter. And they do best in full sun for most of them. It doesn't mean that they won't tolerate some shade, but if you want the best production, you're going to want most of the fruits in full sun. Now we'll see as we go along that there are a few fruits that I'll mention that actually prefer a little bit of shade. So typically you need to remove the, the canes that have passed their time of flowering. So the, the flora canes will be removed after they're done flowering. That's typically done in late winter or early spring when it's not the most severe cold, but you wanna, you wanna do it before the plants start to grow again. And the fruiting canes or the flora canes, those are the ones you want to remove during that dormant period. If you have found that the other primocanes have become so vigorous that they've produced more than really fit into your area, you might wanna remove some of the primocanes to thin them out so that you can get good plant development and also good fruit development. So there's uh, various different ways you can manage your fruit plants. This shows you some examples of, of pruning back some of the blackberries. Notice how they, they will start growing and you can cut off their tips when they're fairly short, but when they reach this stage, that's when they're gonna start producing the flowers. And this is when you're going to want to consider putting them with some kind of support system like a trellis. And that's a kind of examples of different kinds of trellis systems you might consider for the blackberries. It's very similar to what you might use with grapes or what you might have seen if you visited a vineyard. For raspberries, they generally don't need that additional support. And so basically you're, you're removing the flora canes after they're done fruiting and then thinning out the primocanes. And so what's left in B are the primocanes that will be producing the fruit the following year. Big thing with brambles, that's raspberries and blackberries, especially raspberries, you want to avoid planting where solanaceous crops were planted previously. These are crops that are related to potatoes. So things like tomatoes, eggplant, peppers. And the reason is, is because there is a, a disease that's associated with those plants that can also affect your brambles. And so you don't want to have that soil borne disease present when you're starting your new planting. Generally, you wanna plant them about an inch deeper than the depth they were growing in the nursery when you get your plants. And you wanna space them out about three to four feet between plants in a row. And if you have a lot of plants, you might wanna have rows eight to 12 feet apart, but in a home setting, you can get by with them closer together. Typically, the, the larger spacing would be if you plan to have any kind of equipment that you're running between your rows. That's if you're growing a fairly large patch. If you're just growing a single row or two, you can probably plant them closer than the eight feet. And they should be watered regularly until well established. That's fairly standard for all of the plants that I'm going to be talking about tonight, not just the brambles. So a little bit about some of the individual 
groups of, of brambles, the erect blackberries were developed from Eastern native blackberry species. And they generally have stiff upright stems or canes, and they can get up to 12 feet long if they're left unpruned. So that's why it's often good to prune back the tips just so that you don't have them getting all tangled up within each other. And these plants will spread within the area that they're planted and they make their new primer canes, which come from the roots. And those stems that are coming from the roots are often called suckers. And that's just another name for um, stems that are growing from the underground roots. And even though they're called direct blackberries, you do need to support them with some kind of trellis. So erect blackberries generally produce fruits with relatively large seeds. So if, if you don't like the crunchiness of the seeds, they may not be your favorite ones. And their flavor and aroma is not considered as intense as many of the trailing cultivars. So they may not be quite as, as much of a bite for you. And some people have even described the flavor as having a grassy green or bitter flavor. So that's just a little bit of a caveat in case you're thinking, well, the erect black blackberries will be easier to manage because they don't grow as much, but there are some downsides that some people have seen to it. But the erect blackberries are commonly ones grown for the fresh market because they tend to be a firmer berry when they're picked. If you've ever seen blackberries in the store or ever grown your own blackberries, as well as raspberries, you know that they're fairly delicate fruits and they do not ship very well. But of the ones that, that ship the best, the erect blackberries tend to be the ones. So it's kind of a, a bummer that they may not have the best taste, which is another reason why it's really kind of good to grow your own blackberries. Now, there are some types of blackberries as well as some raspberries that have now developed the ability to produce fruit on their first year stems. So there are some primocane fruiting types that will produce fruits in that first year of that stem growth. So before they're technically called a floricane. And that fruit is produced on the tips of the primocanes or on the branches of the primocanes, typically in the fall. And it depends upon the climate, whether it's earlier or later in the fall. Now, the next year they will produce another crop on the stems when we call them floricanes. And they'll be produced on the part of the stem that didn't have any flowers that previous fall. So they'll be a little bit further down on, on the stem. But even though you can get a crop in the fall and a crop the next spring from the same plant, it's often recommended that you may want to only maintain the primocanes and harvest the fall crop and then remove those primocanes to allow more primocanes to come. That means you would only get a fall crop and not both a fall and a summer crop, but you generally will get a little bit better quality berry. Now, the semi-erect blackberries are considered thornless or without prickles, and they tend to be more vigorous than the erect canes, and they grow their stems from a compressed stem that's called a crown. Crowns are compressed stems that are located near the base of a plant. And these semi-erect blackberries can grow much longer canes than the erect ones, up to 20 feet long. And if you don't prune them, they don't actually stand all the way up to 20 feet. They'll actually start flopping over and arch down toward the ground. So that's a reason why they should be attached to some kind of trellis system. And the primocanes are not commonly produced from roots like with the erect blackberries. So they don't spread as fast as the erect blackberries. They, they're a little bit more self-contained if you're worried about them spreading too far. Now for a semi-erect blackberries, you should prune the primocanes in the summer to encourage them to branch and that will increase the fruit production on their second year floricanes. And again, they do require a trellis and compared to the other types of blackberries, the semi-erect ones generally make the highest yield. So that may be something to consider. And the fruit quality is considered similar to the erect blackberries. So it's not quite as good as the 
trailing back blackberries I'm going to talk about next, but they do have a fairly wide ripening period, and that depends upon the cultivar that you happen to plant. Some will mature faster than others. So the trailing back blackberries are the third kind of blackberries, and the main species is the Ursinus species, it's in the Rubus genus. And these are actually native along the Pacific coast from British Columbia to California and inland to Idaho. So they're more of a Western type blackberry, but you can grow them out here. And just like the semi erect ones, they will grow to be about 20 feet long. And generally, instead of arching, they'll just basically trail along the ground unless you put them up with some kind of support system. And again, the new primocanes are produced from that compressed stem or crown rather than from the roots. So this type of blackberry, along with the semi erect ones, they don't spread as fast away from their original planting area as the erect blackberry or the raspberries do. So all of the blackberries, they do better with trellis and especially the trailing ones. If you want to keep your berries off the ground, you need to have them tied up to a trellis. And the berries themselves, the fruits, they've got a fairly long shape and relatively small seeds. So if you aren't a big fan of the seeds in the blackberries, the trailing types are more your type than the erect types. And they also tend to have a more intense flavor. So although the trailing blackberries will probably be the ones that require the most effort to maintain them, they also may give you the best satisfaction as far as the harvest. And again, depending upon the cultivar, they have a fairly wide range where you may get a ripening period. And each cultivar will actually have a, a fairly long period of fruit ripening. So you can get a fairly long season compared to some of the other types of brambles with the trailing blackberries. Downside is that they're considered the least cold hardy of the three types of blackberries. And some of the cultivars have even be, been found to be damaged if the temperatures drop below about 13 degrees, which that can happen here in our part of the country. So you may want to consider uh, protecting the crowns of the plants so that they at least survive that, even though some of the primocanes may not survive the winter, at least you'll have that plant to be able to stay alive. And they're also more sensitive to cold, even as low as the 20s in either late fall or late winter when the plants start losing some of their hardiness. So these are ones that you might want to plant in a more protected location. Now, raspberries, we most associate the red color with red raspberries, and they tend to produce their primocanes from roots. And so they will spread much faster than the semi erect or the trailing blackberries. But they're also black raspberries, and they tend to produce the new primocanes similar to the blackberries from the crowns. So the black raspberries don't spread as far as the red raspberries do if you're concerned about keeping them contained within a smaller area. Now, there are also some raspberry cultivars that produce fruit on the primocanes, just like some of the blackberry cultivars. So you can get a crop on the first year stem before it's technically even called a floricane. And you may see them sold commercially as fall bearing raspberries. That's what they mean by plants that can produce fruit on the first year stems or canes. And just like with the blackberries, the primocane red raspberries will give you fruit in the fall as well as the next spring. Although generally they often recommend that you might only consider growing them for their fall crop and then allowing primocanes to replace them the next year and then just not collecting a uh, summer crop on the floor canes. But if you want to, you can do both. It's not that you have to make a choice to do one or the other. A little bit on cultivars before we finish off with the raspberries and blackberries. Um, there's the yellow gold raspberries. They're a primocane bearing, so these will give you fruit the first year. And they tend to have a sweeter, milder flavor than red raspberries. So if you're looking for a milder flavor. 
And if you're looking for uh, just a spark of color, they are just a, a bright color that's so different from what we usually expect from blackberries and raspberries. And they prefer a sunny site with maybe some afternoon shade. So they will tolerate more shade than some of the other brambles. Another yellow or gold raspberry cultivar is called fall gold. And that one is one that's fairly hardy. And it's got a variation in the fruit color. It can be from light yellow, like you see in the picture, to more of a dark orange. And it also is one that is considered ever bearing, which means it will produce fruit on its primocane as well as the next year when that stem becomes a floricane. So you can get two crops a year with some of the yellow raspberries as well. And another one, a cultivar is Anne, and that's one that produces uh, fruit late in the season. So that's one that's a little bit later if you don't want to harvest them earlier, or if you want to extend the season by having multiple cultivars. This might be one that you'll have to pick from later on in the season. Another one cultivar is double gold. It's kind of a yellowish reddish one. So it's it's got more of a reddish color to it than some of the more yellow types, even though they call it a yellow raspberry. Um, it's been described quote unquote as a deeply blushed golden champagne, but I've never seen champagne quite that reddish color, but you know, to each their own. And it tends to have a, a cone shape, meaning it's a little bit larger, not quite as rounded as some of the other raspberries. And this cultivar also can give you two harvests, one in the fall and one in the following summer, if you so choose. Now, there are some hybrids between blackberries and red raspberries. And some of them were actually developed unintentionally. They were just natural crosses between blackberries and raspberries. And others were intentional. Most of the ones that were unintentional were actually found in plots of blackberries and raspberries that were close enough together to allow cross pollination. And others were found in the wild where the red raspberry was found growing along with the Rubus ursinus blackberry. The one pictured here is actually a type called boysenberry, which you may have heard of. And it's one that does have a fairly large berry. That's something with the hybrids. They tend to have a fairly large elongated berry. And the bramble hybrids tend to have a range of colors from purple to red, sort of depending upon just the genetics of the raspberry and blackberry genotypes that went into making the crosses. So technically, these hybrids are grown as blackberries because their receptacle that core is retained in the fruit when it's picked. So even though it's a cross with a raspberry and a blackberry, when you harvest it, you'll still see that core that stays with the fruit when you remove it from the plant. The one pictured here is one that's, let's see, which I had it. This is the Marion berry, I believe. Yep, this is the Marion berry. That's another hybrid that you may have heard about. And to manage these bramble hybrids between blackberries and raspberries, generally you manage them as you would a trailing blackberry because they have a very similar growth habit. And so you manage them like the trailing types. Now of the bramble hybrids, the one that you probably might be most interested in would be the tayberry. And that's one that was intentionally bred between blackberry and raspberries. And their flavor is considered the most flavorful of the hybrid brambles by many people. Also notice it's got quite a large elongated berry. So when you make a hybrid between species, that's very typical that you often get larger plant parts and that includes the larger fruit. And it tends to be fairly soft when it's fully ripe, but be aware that it does have a lot of prickles or thorns. And so it, it can make it a little bit tougher to harvest, but you might want to grow it a little bit more like the semi erect or thornless blackberries. So it, it has a little bit of a modification to the growing habit. Although, because it will behave much like all of the blackberries, you do want to have some kind of support system with it. Now, there's some other related species 
in the Rubus genus that you may hear about, that you may want to explore. There's one called the thimbleberry, which is Rubus parviflorus. And you can see that it's got um, a fruit that's very much like a raspberry in that the core does not stay attached. That's a fairly attractive flower. So some of these, these brambles may actually, on the edge of your landscape, you might want to have a row sort of like as, as a border for their, their flowering period. Another species in the Rubus genus is Rubus spectabilis, the salmonberry. Not as great a cold tolerance, so you might want to have it in a protected area, but it's got that very attractive salmon-colored flower that some people like. And the berries are, are somewhat compact, but it is uh, a native plant that you might want to consider. Then there are some native black raspberries that are in a different genus than the original black raspberry, which was Rubus occidentalis. This other kind of native black raspberry is Rubus leucodermis, and sometimes it's called the blue raspberry because you can see that the fruit looks somewhat blue. And just so that you can see what they're calling thorns, these are technically prickles just because they're extensions out of those outer cells. They're not really modified branches, but you can see this particular one um, would be a little bit more difficult to pick, but it would be something different to try. And there are some cultivars of them that are available. In the same grouping within the Rosaceae family are strawberries. And so there are some native strawberries. The Chilean strawberry, which is Fregaria chiloensis, is a little bit smaller berry than the hybrid, which is a hybrid between this strawberry and the one I'm going to show you next. So this is not going to give you as big a berry as you would with the hybrid one, but it is considered more flavorful. The other one, which is very common, especially around here, is the mountain or Virginian strawberry, which is Fregaria virginiana, produces those very, very tiny berries that you have to pick a lot of them to really get a good mouthful. But many, many years ago, they actually crossed this species with the one that I listed before. And that's what came up with the hybrid that we go to the store and buy. So the hybrid strawberries that you plant are a cross between Fregaria virginiana and Fregaria chiloensis. Both of them are native to the United States. Now we're still in the Rosaceae family. We're going to talk about service berry. It's in the Amelanchier genus, and there's a number of species. So they're in the Rosaceae family. So they're in the same family as the apples and the pears and the blackberries and the raspberries. Other common names are Saskatoon berry or June berry. And they're a native tree that can either be grown as a tree or can be grown as a multi-stemmed shrub, like what I've got pictured here. So you've got a couple different options with it. And it's also known to be fairly deer resistant, which at least in this part of the state, we have a lot of deer. So if, if you have problems with deer, this might be a plant you want, might want to consider. The service berry is hardy throughout New England. It can get up to 30 feet tall, although you can maintain it shorter. And it will spread a fair amount if you allow it to get taller does tolerate some partial shade, but it does better in full sun. And it likes moist, well-drained soils. Although it will tolerate some wet sites, I just don't think you wanna be planting it in a swamp though. And it is one that's fairly easy to transplant as well. So that's something you might wanna consider. What does the fruit look like? Well, the fruit comes from these attractive white flowers that are very similar to a flower in the rose family. So you can see why it got put into the rose family. But there's the berries and they're described as blueberry-like fruits, but these fruits are actually more closely related to apples and pears than they are to blueberries, which are not in the rosaceae family. So service berry is related to apples and pears more so than it's related to blueberries, even though the fruits kind of look like a blueberry. And the fall foliage is also attractive, ranging from yellow to orange to red. So a number of these fruits can serve both, fruit plants can serve as both a food source as well as an attractive 
addition to your landscape. Some cultivars of service berry include Autumn Brilliance. This one has a fast growth rate and it branches quite a bit. So this is one that you could make into more of a shrub-like appearance like you see in the one pictured here. Another cultivar is actually a hybrid between a couple species and its cultivar name is Robin Hill Pink and it produces pink flower buds that turn white once they're open like you see in the picture here. And again, you can see they've maintained it with multiple stems, more like a shrub than a tree. Another cultivar actually comes from the Western Service Berry, which is in the Amelanchier Altenifolia species. And the cultivar name is Regent. And this one doesn't grow as tall as some of the other service berries. And it produces larger and what some people consider better tasting berries than some of the other ones that I listed before. If you want to go to the other extreme and get a fairly tall one, there's a cultivar called Standing Ovation that has a more of a narrow form and it grows 15 to 25 feet tall. So if you have smaller, narrower spaces, you might want to plant this cultivar instead of the more spreading regent type. So you've got a lot of choices, not as many as with apples, but more so than you might have expected if you didn't know anything about service berries until today. Next plant I want to talk about are aronia berries. And the scientific name is aronia melanocarpa, but it's also in the rose family. So this is related to things like apples and peaches and pears and plums. And this is native. And sometimes it's commonly called the choke cherry, but it should not be confused with a plant in a different genus in the family that is also called choke cherry. The one that's most typically called choke cherry is in the prunus genus. The prunus genus includes things like pears and apricots and plums and cherries. The aronia, aronia is not in that same subgrouping. It is in the same family, but not in the same subgrouping. And so most people call it aronia berries rather than confusing it by calling it the choke cherry. And it will produce many small blue fruits when they're ripe. And as you can see in the picture, they've got an outstanding fall leaf color. So again, they, they can provide not just the fruit, but also a, a pretty, pretty cool dramatic appearance in the fall. Now the fruit will hang on the plant if you don't pick it. So if you like to have a source for feeding birds later on in the season when there aren't as many food sources for them this is something you might want to consider in your landscape and there's those bluish berries that kind of resemble a blueberry but they're more like what the what we call rose hips on the rose plants they're, they're like tiny little tiny little apples almost and some cultivars you might want to consider or names you might hear there's nero and there's viking the one pictured here is the nero cultivar so aronia berry is like full sun and they have similar soil requirements as blueberries, even though they're not in the same family as blueberries. They will tolerate wet soil, but they don't tolerate drought. And the plants do need a fair amount of space if you're going to have multiple plants. And their crowns will grow, the top part of the plant will grow as much as six to nine feet across in diameter. So they, they can occupy a fairly large space in your landscape if you have just a, a single one and they can grow to about seven feet tall so they can get fairly tall unless you do prune them down to some degree now one thing to know about ronia berry is in the first year they require more fertilizer than in subsequent years and the plants will produce their fruit on the previous year's growth so if you go to prune them you want to make sure that you prune them accurately and some of these extension publications that are mentioned at the end can give you more details on the pruning. After they get fairly mature, you don't have to do much pruning other than thinning out the bush every five to eight years. So it's basically early on in the, in the life of the plant and getting that shape that you want. So fruits tend to ripen toward the end of the summer, August to early September. And they actually grow in a cluster of about 15 to 20 small berries in the cluster. 
And what you do is you harvest the entire cluster rather than the individual berries. And then they suggest you freeze them before you knock off the individual berries or make juice from them. And a single bush can produce about 20 pounds. So even though the berries look so small, they actually are, are fairly good producers of fruit. Now, another plant also in the Rosaceae family is the Nankeen cherry. And this one is not native to the United States, but it is a fairly commonly grown one. It is in the Prunus genus, it's Prunus tomentosa. So it is in the Rosaceae family. So it's in the same subgrouping as peaches and apricots and plums and cherries. And it is native to Central Asia, but it was introduced in the United States quite a long time ago in the 1800s. So there has been a lot of history of growing this particular plant in our country. They are winter hardy in our area. For those who may not be familiar with zone numbers, Rhode Island is basically in zone six. And the smaller the number, the colder the temperature the plants will tolerate. So they are hardy to our zone as well as colder areas. They're fairly fast growing species and they will start to set fruit within a couple years, which is faster than with some of the other fruits in the Rosaceae family, like, like the, pe the peaches and the cherries, which may take three to five years to produce a good fruit crop. Okay, so um, the Nanking cherry tends to be a little bit smaller cherry, but it is considered a little bit sweeter, even though it's still a sour cherry. And let's see if I can get, okay, now we aren't, now we aren't going with slide. There we go. So if you don't prune it, it can get up to be at 15, about 15 feet high, but it does have a spreading growth habit. So you can also maintain it as a shrub if you have multiple plants uh, put together a little bit closer than the normal spacing. So the spring flowers are very attractive. They're pink buds and they turn white as the flowers open. Generally like to grow them in the full sun with a fairly decent loamy soil, but they will grow in a lot of different soil types as long as you've got good drainage. And with our high winds that we have in New England, they will tolerate our windy conditions. And some people even use them as uh, little wind breaks. And once they're established, they don't take a lot of maintenance, just like with cherry trees. They don't, because the fruit is a smaller fruit than say an apple or a peach, you don't have to do as much pruning with them. Now, they tend to not be a real long lived plant unless you take proper care of them. And then they may last as long as 50 years, which is fairly long for plants in this particular family. Don't have a lot of insects or diseases. So that's another plus. And they are fairly drought resistant. And they don't self propagate to the point where they would be considered an invasive type plant, even though they're not native to our country. So it is one that, that you might consider as, as somewhat naturalized in that it will fit into your landscape without overtaking your landscape. Now, another one that we're gonna talk about is in a new family, the Ericaceae family, and it's the huckleberry, but huckleberries are really just native blueberries. And the blueberries and cranberries are in a family known as Ericaceae, and there's, two basic species of huckleberries that are grown, the evergreen huckleberry, which is Vaccinium ovatum, and the red huckleberry, which is Vaccinium parvifolium. Although the evergreen huckleberry is the one that's most commonly grown. And they actually are considered to be an understory shrub that grows in mixed and low elevation forests. So they will grow under somewhat shady conditions if you've got more of a shady location. And they also will tolerate some poor soils and even sandy soils. And they are pretty much hardy to our zone, although we can get below 10 degrees, minus 10 degrees in some years. So there may be some years when you may get a little bit of, of loss of some of the above ground stems. And because they're fairly low growing, they're often grown as a hedge. And another benefit with us being near an ocean is they are tolerant of salt spray. 
So those of you who may live near a coastline might want to consider the evergreen huckleberry. Tend to have a medium growth rate and they're described as a leafy, compact, bushy, upright to spreading and dense plant. And that picture shows one growing in its natural habitat among other trees surrounding it. And they generally will get to be about two to three feet tall and wide if you grow them in the sun. But if they are grown in the shade because they're going to try and reach more sunlight, they'll get taller and they'll get to be about eight to 10 feet tall if you grow them in a shadier location. So that's something you could do to affect the height of the plant. Now the flowers are about a half inch long and they can be pink or white. So they're a fairly attractive flower, very similar to blueberry flowers since they are in the same family. And the fruits themselves are spherical, blue to black or even black. And they may have a whitish waxy kind of bloom on them, even though the one in this picture doesn't show that waxiness to it. The fruit itself tends to be a little bit smaller than blueberries and they're described as having a tangy flavor. So a, a little bit more of a, a bite to them than the typical blueberry. And this picture shows uh, various different stages of growth of huckleberry out in Oregon, which would kind of be similar to our climate, a little bit warmer, but mid April, you would see what you see in, in picture A in the middle of the summer, you'll see what, you see in picture B and then in mid to late summer is when you could start to harvest the berries. Another plant in the Ericaceae family or the blueberry cranberry family are lingonberries. And they're in the same genus as blueberries and cranberries, as well as the huckleberry. In this case, they're the Vetus idae species. And as I mentioned, they're in the Ericaceae family. And other common names you might have heard them called are cowberry, moss cranberry, mountain cranberry, and red whortleberry. So there's a lot of common names associated with this particular species. And they are closely related to cranberry and blueberry being in the same family. And the fruits are red like cranberries, but they tend to be a little bit smaller in size. And they tend to be sweeter than cranberries, even though they're still somewhat tart. So the actual plant is described as a woody evergreen dwarf shrub that gets to be only about one to one and a half feet tall. So it's not a super large plant and it is native to northern areas of the northern hemisphere. Some are native to the United States. Some are native over in areas of Europe. And the fruit is used for things like juices, jellies, preserves and sauce. And the plants themselves also make attractive ornamental shrubs because they don't get overly tall. And they're reproduced by underground stems called rhizomes. So these thick white structures are not roots. Those are actually underground stems that will have buds that will produce new stems that will then emerge above the ground to produce the bush. And they can be productive for more than 15 years if they're maintained properly but you generally need for the best amount of fruit set to have more than one cultivar so you do need a little bit of cross pollination to help improve the fruit set so lingonberries normally produce two crops a year one in the summer and one in the fall and an individual plant yields not a whole lot about a half to a pound per plant because they are somewhat of a small plant and in a year where you might have a late frost, the summer crop, the first crop might not be as productive because it may get damaged by the late frost, but you still should get a fall crop, even if you lose your spring crop. So lingonberries are generally managed very similar to blueberries. They do require an acidic soil and you should not over fertilize them or over irrigate them. They're spaced fairly close together because they're, they're somewhat smaller plants compared to some of the other spacings that we've talked about. And you don't want to fertilize them too heavily because they will die back with too much fertilization. So if you want to be growing lingonberries, check out the fact sheets that are available from the various extension centers that give you very detailed lists of how much fertilizer to use and exact times of the year to be doing that fertilization so that you 
don't damage the plants. So lingonberries generally aren't pruned during the first four years after planting. And then when they're about five years old, if you've got several plants in rows, you may wanna consider mowing alternate rows to two inches every three to six years to sort of renew that area and keep them from becoming too dense. And Oregon State University um, has a very good production guide with a lot more specifics if this is one that interests you in particular. Cultivars of lingonberry that you might be interested in. Red pearl is a wide bushy plant. It's got fruits about a quarter, half inch in diameter, and it's bright red fruits that ripen in September to October. And that's what you see pictured here. Corral is another cultivar and it spreads a little bit more slowly than the other cultivars and its fruits tend to be a little bit darker red than the previous cultivar and the third cultivar is actually one that was developed from the wild in germany and brought to our country it's called Erntedank, which is why it's got such a funny sounding cultivar name and it tends to be a fairly moderate growth habit but it is also very, very productive compared to some of the other cultivars. So you'll get a little bit more per plant with this particular cultivar. Another plant, next plant I wanna talk about are elderberries. And there are many species native to North America. They are in the Adoxaceae family. So they're in their own family, separate from the blueberries and the rose family. And the one that's most commonly grown, the species that's most commonly grown is Sambucus nigra, subspecies canadensis, which is a type of a black elderberry. Other species of elderberry include the straight black elderberry that's Sambucus nigra, and the blue elderberry, which is Sambucus nigra, subspecies cerulea. Cerulea is a bluish color. And there's also a red type that's uh, Sambucus racemosa. So elderberries, the fruits can be used for juices, sauce, jelly, and wine. And even the flowers can be used to flavor drinks. And you can even batter and fry them similar to squash flowers. So there's a, a lot of different ways you can use elderberries. They do like the full sun. And they will tolerate quite a wide range of soil as well as quite a wide range of moisture levels. And they do like a fairly acidic pH, so they will like our kind of pHs here in New England. And they can get up to be 12 feet tall if, if you don't cut them back. So generally you establish the plants in the spring, and if you've got a lot of plants, you wanna space them apart to allow them to spread. And within the row, five to six feet. And if you have several rows, you wanna have enough space between the rows because they will fill in those rows, not completely, but enough that you will just have enough space to get yourself through there and maybe a piece of equipment or two. Don't wanna fertilize them the first year, but then you use a well-balanced fertilizer in succeeding years. The various fact sheets have a lot of specifics if you're interested in growing elderberries. What they do as far as fruiting is they make these large fruit clusters at the tip of the current season's growth. So you can see the flowers on the right, and then you can see the fruits on the left in this photograph. And they're most productive on wood that's two to three years old. So you do want to maintain them by maintaining wood that's continually young enough to support the best growth. And any wood that's weak or damaged or any stems or canes that are more than three years old are ones that you want to remove because they're the ones that will either weaken the plant or not be as productive fruit wise. So the thing with elderberries is you generally wanna leave equal numbers of one, two and three year old canes or stems per plant. And so you generally one guideline is, is leave three one year old, three two year old and three three year old stems. And so every year you're going to be removing stems just to keep them basically rejuvenated. And it takes about three to four years to get to their maximum production. But once they get to that maximum production, you can expect about 12 to 15 pounds of fruit per plant. So they are, are fairly good at producing fruit. 
even though it's not a particularly large fruit. They generally will be ripe in late summer, depending upon the cultivar and your growing conditions. <clears throat> so the cus clusters will ripen over a period of up to two weeks. And generally, instead of picking individual berries, you want to harvest entire clusters. And you either want to process them or freeze them, because if you start removing those individual berries, they will start to become squished and you'll get it, lose a lot of juice. and They just will become unwieldy to work with. And they're mildly poisonous if they're consumed raw. So they're better off if you actually process them by some kind of cooking process, like making them into a sauce or a jelly, rather than popping them into your mouth straight from the bush. Some cultivars include things like Adams and Nova and York. The one pictured here is, is Nova, and they are partially self-fruitful, but if you plant more than one cultivar, you'll get more fruit set with the cross-pollination. So you can see that the individual clusters are, are fairly productive. Now we're gonna move on to a, a plant that's getting a lot of attention in certain parts of the country. And it's one that's kind of interesting because it, it's, it produces a fruit that gives you the impression of, of some of our tropical fruits. And those are, that's the pawpaw. And its scientific name is Acema triloba, meaning it's got three leaves. And it's in the Ananaceae family, which is also known as the custard apple family. So it kind of gives you a little bit of a hint about what the fruit might be like. And it is native from New York to Florida and west to Texas. So it is another plant that's native to our country. And it gives the impression of being sort of a semi-tropical tree, even though it grows in our climate which is not tropical. So the native trees produce these mango-like fruits that are said to have hints of a banana flavor and sort of a custard-like consistency. And you have to have a male plant and a female plant in order to get fruit. <clears throat> Excuse me, so the male plant provides the pollen and the female plant produces the fruit. If you only have a male plant, you won't get fruit. And if you only have a female plant, you probably will not get much fruit. They may set a little self fruit, but you won't get as much as if you've got both sexes present. Other than that, they're fairly easy to grow. So the pawpaw plant is described as a round, upright, pyramidal tree. It's got a moderate density and a coarse texture, and it can be about 15 to 20 feet tall and about the same kind of width. So it, it occupies a fairly large space for an individual plant. And in an ideal location, it can even reach even taller up to 40 feet. But usually people maintain them shorter just for ease of harvesting the fruits. Now pawpaws are known for their fruit because that produces the largest berry of any tree native to the United States. And those fruits you see pictured there can be up to five inches long. So think about the size of the raspberries and blackberries and the size of the pawpaw. A single pawpaw has the same volume as a lot of those raspberries and blackberries. And the fruit is considered very nutritious and it's even been used in cancer therapies. And the twigs and the bark contain a natural insecticide. So not just the fruit, but other parts of the plant have been found to be useful, which is why it's got a lot of interest. Uh, University of Kentucky has a very large pawpaw production program, including breeding of pawpaws, and they've got the best information about pawpaw production if you're interested in more details. So they do like a fertile, moist soil, and they do tolerate a slightly acidic soil. So our soils in New England will keep it happy. They will sometimes tolerate wet soil, but you don't want to make it swampy like some of our soils. And they can be grown in either the sun or the shade. In the sun, they'll have more dense growth. And in the shade, the growth will be more open and not quite as dense. And if you mulch and water them during droughts, like shown in the picture, they will grow better. So a mulching can help if you end up in a situation where the weather takes a turn for the worse. And they are drought sensitive 
especially if they're grown in the full sun. So not quite as much of a concern if you've got them grown in some shade. So they are hardy to our zone six area, as well as colder and warmer areas. And the seedlings actually should be protected that first year because they're sensitive to ultraviolet light. So you do want to keep them from, from getting too stressed that first year. They do tend to be fairly pest free, which is something that's fairly common with, with our native plants. And you can train them to be a single trunk or multiple trunks. The limbs are also fairly break resistant, which is good in our windy type of climate. And what you want to do is any pruning you might do is you want to do it to clear off any drooping branches that might be sagging toward the ground. Also, there may be some suckers that may come from toward the base. Some of these cultivars are grafted. So you want to make sure that you don't allow any stems that are below that graft to grow. <clears throat> and for the best seed set, it's best to have more than one cultivar that aren't related. So you get some cross pollination and then the fruit develops in cl clusters like you see pictured here, but you don't have a lot of fruits because their individual fruits are so big in and of themselves. And the ones that have the orange flesh are considered the tastiest, even though most of the ones have more of a yellowish flesh. Oh my gosh, we're after eight o'clock already. It is going. okay. We're we're eating this up. You okay, keep going. It's great. Now, another thing about pawpaws is they attract wildlife. So if you are into having a lot of nature, if you like raccoons and possums, gray squirrels and birds. They will attract that and they also attract the zebra waller swallowtail butterfly. So they're, they're very good for um, the whole ecosystem of our area. So the fruits themselves are generally anywhere from three to five inches long. They're green when they're young, but they, they become dark and wrinkled when they're ripe later in the fall. And that's what they look like internally when you cut them open. And that fruit is described as a flesh-like custard. And it's said to taste a lot like bananas, although I must confess I have yet to taste a pawpaw myself, but I hope to soon. Excellent source of vitamins A and C and also high in unsaturated fats, proteins, carbohydrates. They're just one of those wonder fruits. And they do contain more potassium, phosphorus, magnesium, and sulfur than even apples, grapes, and peaches. So you might want to get a pawpaw plant or two into your diet. There are at least 45 cultivars and there are breeding programs continually working on new cultivars. A couple of the ones listed, there's Allegheny, which is said to have a texture that's medium firm and smooth with that yellow flesh color. Overlease produces a lot of fruit that's fairly large, up to one pound each. And that was uh, selected out of Indiana. And a seedling from Overlease produced the cultivar Shenandoah that also has a creamy yellow flesh and not quite as many seeds as some of the other pawpaws. So if you don't like having to pick out as many seeds. Another cultivar is sunflower and it produces a fruit that's a little bit smaller, but it's got a butter yellow flesh and it's one that's said to be somewhat self fertile. So you may not have to have more than one plant in order to grow the pawpaw. Couple more that we have that we're going to go through fairly fast. There's persimmons, they're in the Ebenaceae family. There's the Asian persimmon, which really isn't too hardy in our area unless you're protected and want to take a chance. But that's the kind of persimmon you usually will see in the grocery store. The one you're more likely to want to grow is the American persimmon that's Diasporus virginiana. It's faster growing and a larger tree than the Asian persimmon. And it is hardy to our area. Both of them have an attractive foliage like you see here. And a little bit on the Asian persimmon in case you wanna take a chance on it. It goes by other names like Oriental, Chinese, Japanese, or Kaki persimmon. And the trees can get up to 30 feet, three feet tall, but they're usually shorter like the one pictured here. And the leaves kind of resemble a magnolia leaf if, if you're trying to get an image of what that really looks like from that picture. Now, there are dioecious. It means there are male plants and there are female plants, although some cultivars have flowers that are both male and female. That's what 
I have I have plants that have both male flowers and female flowers on the same plant. Okay. So if you have a preference and don't want to have to plant two persimmons, you want to get a cultivar that's monoecious. That'll have both male and female flowers on the same plant. So all varieties are considered parthenocarpic, which means they produce seedless fruit if they aren't pollinated. <laughs> so just having the female plant may be desirable if you don't like to have a lot of seeds in your fruit. If you have the male and the female plants, or if you have monoecious plants, they will get more seeds in them and they may not be quite as desirable. So some people may prefer just to have the female plants. And that's what the fruits look like. They're round acorn shape. They get orange when they're ripe. And the flavor is described as somewhat like cantaloupe, even though I must confess I've not tried that. Now the American persimmon, which are more likely to be successful growing here, that has trees that reach to 20 feet tall. They're fairly easy to grow. They like a fairly good soil, but they will tolerate some poor soil and they do better in full sun. Now they're also dioecious, but there are a number of them that are self fruitful. So you may only have to have the female plant. And when you have only the female plant, they will be seedless. And one example of a cultivar you might look for is one that's called meter, like the one, and that's what's pictured here. It's got a smaller fruit than the Asian persimmon, but it's said to be tastier. It probably is because it's got less water in it. And they're eaten either fresh or dried. Now, kiwi fruit, I've got a lot of slides on this, and so I'm going to go zipping right past them and, and actually not show you them um, and talk about them individually. The kiwi fruit is in the Actinidaceae family. And the genus is actinid actinidia, and the kind that's pictured here is actually not able to be grown in our climate. That's the fuzzy brown one that's egg-shaped with the green or golden flesh. And that one, it would be a little bit dicey to try and grow it in our climate. But there are other species that bear a smaller size fruit than the typical kiwi fruit, and they've got a smooth, edible skin, and they are hardier. And there's a whole section on them, but I'm going to skip pretty fast past them so that we can get to the end of our talk and not have you here till 10 o'clock. So this picture just shows you the difference in size between the conventional kiwi you're probably familiar with and the ones that are hardy in our area. And there are several slides that talk about how to grow them. They are not native to the United States, so they are ones that are introduced but if you grow the ones that are hardy here, they generally probably will not become an invasive type plant. And some of them are good for producing fruit. Others are good for producing just ornamental appearances. So the plants are also dioecious. And so you need both a male and a female plant. There are some self fruitful cultivars if you don't want to have male plants and they actually grow as vines. And so in managing kiwi fruit, you basically manage them a lot like grapes in, in a vineyard type setting. And so there's several slides that are like that, that I'm going to go past. And if you want more information on the growing of them, there's some really good extension publications you can get to. So this shows you how you can tell a male flower on the left from the female flower on the right. And the flavor varies a lot between cultivars. They are fairly nutritious but they are also high in, in oxalic acid. And so if you're susceptible to kidney stones, you might want to limit your eating of kiwi fruits of the various different species. So there's all a lot of information on growing them and maintaining them very much like a grape, but the ones that are hardy here tend to have a smaller fruit. And this one, Cultivars known as Ananasnea. It took me a while to pronounce that one. And that's what the fruits look like after the plants are about three years old. And I'm going to get down to showing you them. So the kiwis that are hardy here are typically called kiwi berries. They were previously called hardy kiwis, but um, the more preferred name is kiwi berries. The one that's most commonly grown is 
Actinidia arguta, which is a small fruited, smooth skinned kiwi fruit that will be adapted to our zone. And that's what's pictured here in this picture. And so commonly called kiwi berries. And they generally have a green or red flesh. So there's a little bit more variability when the, than with the green that you're used to with the regular kiwi. And you typically, in your home, you're going to plant one female vine and one male vine in order to get your fruit. So they do grow as a vine, just like grapes. And because they are susceptible to verticillium wilt, which is a soil borne disease, just like with the brambles, you want to avoid planting either brambles or any kind of potato like crops in that same area. So you want to plant them in an area that didn't previously have brambles or tomatoes or potatoes or peppers. Very productive vines when they mature up to 60 to 150 pounds, although the yields vary. And that's what they look like when you are harvesting them. And basically the best way to tell whether or not they're ripe is if you taste them and they taste good. And also if the seeds are dark brown, if the seeds aren't dark brown, then they're probably not ripe enough. So the Ananasnea fruit is what's pictured here, and it has varying shades of color, depending upon whether it's grown in the sun or the shade. And once the fruit starts to soften, that's when you might start trying to taste it to see if it's got the right flavor. And they do ripen fairly slowly, so you can pick them and ripen them off the vine. So there's a lot of information on how to Harvest them so that you don't damage the skin because if you tear the skin, it's going to make it not as storable. And these are the cultivars you might want to be looking for. There's the one that I can't pronounce, Ananasnaya. And sometimes people just call it Anna, which sounds a lot better. And the fruits of the hardy kiwi berries are much smaller than the, the typical kiwi that you're used to seeing in the store. So they're only about an inch long. They've got a green skin, but they develop a red blush if they're exposed to the sun. They stay more greenish if they're in the shade. And their flavor is very similar to the kiwi that is not as hardy here. They are fall ripening plant. So that shows you them uh, sun exposed versus shade exposed on the left versus the right. So depending upon where you're growing them, just looking at the skin will not necessarily tell you if they're ripe or not. So there's um, the same cultivar and you wanna try and avoid them rubbing against each other because they'll get that scarring that you see here. Another a cultivar that you might be interested in is called Ken's Red and that's pictured here. And it starts as a green flesh that gets red streaks and they turn reddish purple when they're fully ripe. So it's, it's a little bit different color palette for you. And they're similar to the Anna cultivar, but they will ripen a little bit earlier. So there's some more pictures. Another species of kiwi berry is Actinidia columnica, and that's the Arctic kiwi fruit. It's the most hardy one. So if you're in an area where you're a little bit concerned about the hardiness, or if you end up moving, say, to Maine, you might want to consider growing this particular cultivar, or the species and its cultivars. This one also has a very attractive variegated fall color that's, that's shown here. And the one cultivar of the Arctic one, I couldn't find a picture of it. So we'll go right on by. Real fast, there's the Cornelian cherry dogwood, which is not a cherry. It's in the dogwood family, which is the Cornaceae family. The scientific name is Cornus moss. It's got yellow flowers like pictured here, and it grows as a small, slow growing tree or shrub doesn't get super tall it will tolerate full sun to part shade medium moisture well-drained soil ph pretty wide range ph including our acid ones here in new england and it is hardy to our zone six it is native to southern asia and europe but it has been grown here for a number of years and that's the fruit which are tart red berries that ripen in the fall so basically if you grow them for the berries, you wanna make jam out of them, but they're also good as an ornamental plant. Another one is the Hascap berry. That's in the honeysuckle family. So this is Lanisra cerulea, and that's the Caprifoliaceae family, which is 
scientific name for the, the honeysuckle family. So this hascap berries are sometimes sold as honey berries. And they are actually not native to our country, but they are hardy to minus 47 degrees, which if we ever see minus 47 degrees here in Kingston, I might as well move back to Wisconsin, okay? And you can space them as individual plants or you can grow them in a hedge like the picture there. So there's a lot of variability in how you grow them. And most of the cultivars require more than one cultivar for, for the best fruit set. That's what it means by not self fruitful. They've got small yellow flowers that tolerate the frost and that's what the berries look like. They're oval to dark blue and they're fairly tart, but they ripen before the June berry, straw, June berry and strawberries. So they're fairly early fruit if you're looking for an early fruit. And they've been described as a cross between a blueberry and a grape flavor. So if you take a bite of a blueberry and a grape at the same time, that's what the has cap is like. So you wanna prune them in late winter and you don't remove a lot of the plant like you do with some of the other plants, but there's more details on growing them, especially at Oregon's site. Last one I wanna mention is fig, which you may not think is one that can grow here, but the ficus carica genus and species in the Moraceae family or the fig family, also known as the Chicago hardy fig or the Bensonhurst purple fig, grows about 10 to 15 feet tall, nine to 12 feet canopy width, and it's right on the edge of tolerance of our area. Some, some sources say it tolerates zone six, others say it's better a little bit further south. So this is one that, that if you're adventurous, you might wanna try growing if you like figs. And it is cold hardier than what you might expect, but it, if you're worried about it, protecting it with mulch in the winter is a good idea and also maintaining it fairly close to the ground so that you can cover up as much of that plant material as you can. Don't need a lot of maintenance and they're fairly drought tolerant. So they're, they're fairly easy to grow and they like full sun, but they'll tolerate shade, like organically rich soils. And they have some pests, but if you like figs, this might be something you might wanna try if you're adventuresome. Last thing I wanna mention, Gooseberries and currants. These are small shrubs in the genus Ribes in the Gracilariaceae family. There are some native species, but, and they include black, red, and white types, but they're only allowed in some areas in Rhode Island and you have to get a permit from DEM. And the reason is, is because they're an alternate host for white pine blister rust. And we have some Christmas tree farms here that don't want to be ruined by that white pine blister, blister rust. So you don't wanna be growing it anywhere near a uh, Christmas tree farm or any place that's got white pines in their yards. And so that's why it's, it's very much regulated in Rhode Island, more so than in a lot of other states. And black currants in particular are prohibited everywhere in Rhode Island. The flower currants, flowering currants are also prohibited throughout much of Rhode Island. So if you do wanna grow a currant or a gooseberry, um, you need to get a permit from DEM and you're just as likely as not to be told no. So that's what black currants look like. And that's what the red currants look like. And that's what gooseberries look like. They've got a really cool looking fruit, but because they're that alternate host for that white pine blister rust, you don't wanna mess with them. So a lot of resources, Cornell has a great fruit growing guide, guide with a lot of detail. Um, Penn State produced a publication called Fruit Production for the Home Gardener. It's available from them for purchase, but if you go to the University of Wisconsin Extension website, you can download a copy without having to buy it. And there are various publications at places like Oregon State University, University of Kentucky, University of Minnesota, in addition to other universities around the country, but these in particular were good sources for much of the information if you want more details about the fruits that I've talked about today. And now I'm back to you, Sajal. My gosh, that was so much fun. My dog watched the entire time. <laughs> Not joking, that was amazing. You are like a walking encyclopedia. I learned so much about fruits um, that you know I knew could grow here and so many that 
I've never heard of. And I think um, that is what we're sensing from the crowd here as well. We have a couple of questions, but I've narrowed them down. I've had some really great side conversations. And along the way, I found some of the resources that you were talking about and I dropped them um, into the chat. But do you mind if I ask you just a few questions? Mm -hmm. That's All fine. Right, cool. yeah. I know you've got some homework. Uh, you've got still some work to do, so we won't <laughs> keep you too long. So one good question that came in was, how do you tell the difference between raspberry canes and the invasive wineberry canes? Um, the wineberry cane, I had, this was a question I had earlier, and I looked it up and I can't tell you right at the moment. <laughs> But no. there is a way to tell them apart. Yes. Okay. okay. There is a way to tell them apart. But that being said, raspberries in and of themselves can be somewhat invasive themselves. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to grow even raspberries, not not just the wine berries, but even the raspberries, you do want to make sure that that you contain them because they will spread of all of the brambles I talked about. But yes, the wine berries are even more invasive. So that's a, that's a tricky situation. And, so and you can't tell them apart, but right now my brain is a little bit frozen. So I apologize. Yeah, no problem. And I, I'm not exactly sure who asked that, but um, we might be able to help have our hotliners help research that question. But also one of my favorite techniques for searching the internet, which is full of good stuff and full of really junky stuff, is to type in what you're looking for and type in the word extension afterwards, mm -hmm. and it will pull up a lot of reputable cooperative extension research science backed information. Um, so another question, um, someone said that, I think this is a common one. So um, new to their house and they have brambles in the yard and they've never fruited before. Their backyard was quite neglected. Um, so is there, a, is there a kind of a way to rehab um, that overgrown bramble issue? Would you recommend just plowing it down at a certain point and starting over or doing a little bit more fine pruning, selective um, mm -hmm. clipping there? Well, right? it would be good if they could try and identify it, <laughs> but if they can't, Probably just mowing it down and limiting what grows back. And what happens is, is when plants get so thick vegetatively, especially the ones that spread by stems that grow from the roots, the more dense they are with vegetation, the less they will fruit. And so my recommendation, if they want to see what's there, I would just mow it down and let it grow back. If they wanted to start over, yes, just go ahead and kill it off and plow it up and, and get what you really want. Sounds good. And if uh, that person that did enter that question, and if you're still there, you can take some pictures and send it to um, our hotline. That information is right there on that slide. Um, two more questions. Uh, one, can service berry bush slash tree be propagated from suckers, uh, possibly with the use of like a growth hormone? Um, yes, many of them can. And, and hardwood cuttings are one way of, of doing it you might use a rooting hormone typically with some of them because the um and i'm not sure if it's a service barrier if it's one of the others i'm mixing up there's there's one that's got buds that are kind of roundish and what you want to do is you want to make a slanted cut on the upper end so you know which way to stick it into the growing medium and usually you know like a moist sand is good to grow it in cool Okay, and lastly, um, huckleberries, would they be a good choice for health strip planting from all the rolled road salt since they are tolerant um, to salt spray? I would think I so. Yes, I, like I would definitely try them over a lot of other plants. Great. Dr. Romo, we are so lucky to have you. I've gotten the luxury of proctoring some of your previous lectures on our Learn at Home series, and it has just been awesome. Thank you so, so much. Um, hopefully we'll have you back, but this was really great. And I hope you don't mind because you're gonna get a lot of questions from me in the future as That's well. Okay. So we got some hardy kiwi going and we're still learning, learning as we go. And it's growing really great on our pool fence, just as a little side note there. I, know, I had all these slides on hardy kiwi because it was, I, know, I thought that was so cool because cool. <laughs> I love kiwis, but I realized that, you know, we kind of had to skip all right, through well, them, but I don't know you if they can, talk if they can slow down the, the replay and look at the individual slides. 
we'll have to see what our tech uh, master gardener wizards can do. But thank you so much uh, for your time. I'm going to wrap it out up here with this closing slide. So you guys have heard me, you know, say on and on about our hotline, but I just think it is such an amazing service. So if you have questions as you grow, um, please send pictures um, at, or whatever your situation is to gardener at uri.edu. We have a ton of gardening resources available via that link uh, right up top. And for right now, our Learn at Home webinar series is every other Tuesday. This information is a little outdated and you can find um, all of our previous lectures recorded and in closed captioning uh, on our YouTube channel. If you have general questions, there's our information right there. And lastly, in the chat, because I think you guys are all gonna find it really awesome, is uh, information on our garden tour. Uh, every two years, the URI, uh, Master Gardeners put on a garden tour where you can go and see some of the things that Dr. Rummel was talking about, pawpaws and uh, all these kinds of berries and all kinds of other important aspects of gardening, planting with natives, planting in tight spaces. So if you wanna check out gardens um, and learn a little bit that way, check out our Master Gardener tour. And I think that's it folks. Thanks so much for joining us. This was a lot of fun. I learned a lot and we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks, Dr. Rommel. Appreciate you. Oh, you're you're welcome. I enjoy it. <laughs>